Hey, Logan. Come on down, bud. All right, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Happy Sunday. We are going to sing a song here to begin. So please stand up wherever you are at home in person. Will the congregation please stand up? <laughs> and we will begin worshiping our God this morning. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will and rejoice, rejoice for, for he, he has made, made me glad. glad. He, he has made, made me glad. glad. He, he has made, made me glad. glad. I will I rejoice, rejoice for, for he, he has made me glad. glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will, I will rejoice, rejoice for, for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will, I will rejoice, rejoice for he has made me glad. Good morning, church. Good morning, Dustin. Can you guys hear me? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. So we have a few announcements today, the first of which, um, next week, actually this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, nope, I'm going out of order. We'll, we'll, good morning, church. Good morning, Justin. So through the summer months, May, June, July, and August, we're going to be having one life group a month. For the month of May, we're going to be meeting on May 21st, immediately following worship. Ben's going to be leading that discussion, and what we're going to be talking about is living into biblical community. So come out and be a part of that. The theme for the meal, I believe, is no theme. No, it's your favorite meal. Your favorite meal. They're not open on Sunday. Your favorite meal. Here's what we're going to ask, though. Please still let Amy know what you plan on bringing, because if everyone's favorite meal is meatballs, then we're just going to have a ton of meatballs. So please let her know what you plan on bringing. But again, that's May 21st, right after our worship service. We're going to be sharing in that life group together. Next, um, this coming Saturday, May 13th, when? May 13th. May 13th, which is? This Saturday. Okay. We're going to be having a ladies' breakfast here at the building, okay, from 8 to 10 a.m. Ladies, you will be served by the men of our congregation, okay? Food will be prepared. Food will be brought to your tables, okay? So all you have to do is sit and eat. It should be a good time for you. Uh, fellas, if you plan on volunteering, please talk to Charlie today. Um, food has already been purchased for the event, so if you would like to donate to help pay for the food, please talk to Charlie, and I believe we're asking people to, men, to get here at 7 in the morning, okay? So ladies, you guys can show up any time from 8 to 10. Guys, please be here at 7 if you plan on helping out. Everybody understand that? And that is when? Saturday, May 13th. Yes, good deal. And then lastly, today, Charlie has our closing prayer. His number is 330 316-2411. Okay, so if you have any prayer requests today, you can text those to Charlie throughout our service, and he will pray over those things at the conclusion of our service today. Yeah, right? On to youth worship, everyone. Stand on up, stand on up, stand on up. Quick, quick. We're going to start with a song. We're going to do a little out of order today. Potato chip, potato chip, crunchy, crunchy. I love 
love Jesus a bunchy bunchy potato chip potato chip crunchy crunchy I love Jesus a bunchy bunchy there once was a woman Walk like this. But then she met Jesus. And now she walks like this. Woo! Potato chip, potato chip. Crunchy, crunchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. Potato chip, potato chip. Crunchy, crunchy. I love Jesus a bunchy bunchy. There once was a man. There once was a man who walked like this. But then he met Jesus. And now he walks like this. Woo! Potato chip, potato chip, crunchy, crunchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. Potato chip, potato chip, crunchy, crunchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. Kiddos, wait. It only makes sense to mention my dog here. My dogs, Linus and Aurora. And they tend to be country dogs, and so it's not about the potato chips, it's about the tater tots. They love themselves some tater tots. Tater tots, tater tots, munchy, munchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. Tater tot, tater tot, munchy, munchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. There once was a doggy. There once was a doggy. Who went? But then he met Jesus. And now he goes. Bah, 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 bah. Tater tot, tater tot, bunchy, munchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. Tater tot, tater tot, munchy, munchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. Sit on down, sit on down. Who here loves Jesus? Yeah, I love Jesus too. Do you know in Matthew 22, children, say Matthew, Matthew. 22. 22. It says there are two of the greatest commandments. Can anyone tell me what those two great commandments are? Do Rock, paper, scissors is not it. Close. Yes, Anna. To love God, all right, there's one, love God with all your heart, all right? What's the other one? What's the other greatest commandment? Love God and love who? Love. I'm hearing it whispered. Zakai, what is it? What is it? People, yeah. Love people. Two of the greatest commandments are to love God and to love people. How do we show that we love God, kiddos? How do we show God that we love him? Yes, Jace. He loved us, and that's why we love him most definitely. How do we show God that we love him? Yeah, Logan. We could give God presents, okay. <laughs> our giving, all right. We're going to talk about that later, all right. Through our giving, right, our offerings. What else? What are ways that we show God we love him? Any of the dolls able? Oh, Kensington. I know it's a tough one. What was that? Be kind to others. We can show God that we love him by loving people. Isn't that cool? We can honor both of the greatest commandments at the same time. So kiddos, just remember, as you go throughout your week, we want to love God and love people. All right? Let me hear you say, love God, love, God. love, people. love people. Follow God's word and treat people kindly. Good job, kiddos. We're going to sing one more verse of potato chip, potato chip as the kids go ahead and head on back to class to learn about loving Jesus and other people that love Jesus in the Bible. All right? Go ahead and head on back. Potato chip, potato chip, crunchy, crunchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. Potato chip, potato chip, 
crunchy, crunchy. I love Jesus a bunchy, bunchy. All right. Go ahead and keep on staying for the songs here, church. All right. I don't know if this song will be as objectively entertaining as potato chip, potato chip. Uh, but just as, as we sing, um, what I like to do, uh, this, this may sound really obvious, but just to really focus on what the words are saying. So as we are singing today, some songs that maybe we know really well, so maybe we haven't sung in a while, I know we haven't sung this one in a while, but whatever song it is, just think about what the words are actually saying, what we're actually lifting up to God. And I just take, take some time to worship him, you know, to really lift up your hearts to him. So let's sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses. Sure. 
show his power and might, and that's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything, and that's why we bow down and worship his king, because he gave his everything, because he gave his everything. his love he came to go prepare a place for us and that's why we praise him that's why we sing that's why we offer him our everything and that's why we bow down and worship this king because he gave his He gave his everything. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. That's why we pray. sing uh, Magnificat here, and then Dustin will get up and deliver his message. Mm. My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit Rejoices in God. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My Savior, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit.
Good morning, church. So, we're going to be continuing today in the sermon series we've been working through the past couple of weeks, uh, Discipleship Dictionary. And today, uh, we're going to continue with what we had been talking about last week. But before we do that, let's all bow. Let's say a word of prayer together. Father, you are so good. And God, you are loving and kind. You are gracious and merciful. God, you are mighty and you are worthy of our praise. And God, there is, there is none like you. God, I'm thankful for this moment that we've had to lift you up in song. And God, it's my prayer that this praise that we've lifted up to you is pleasing to you. God, that as we sing, we would come not distracted, uh, but God, willing to lift up everything that we have to you. God, as we spend some time in your word this morning, I pray that you would move me out of the way. God, that your spirit would fill me, that your spirit would fill this place. God, that our ears and our minds and our hearts might be open and ready to receive this message. God, that we would not just hear it, but that we would also understand and apply it. God, this, probably more so than anything that we see in Scripture, is, is vital for us to know and to understand. And so, God, I pray this morning that you would give us the understanding that we need. Not just, God, that we would know this intellectually, but that we would put it into practice. God, that this would make its way from our head to our heart to our hands. I love you. I thank you for Jesus, God. I thank you so much for what he gave for us, God. The fact that he gave his life in our place. That he hung on that cross taking our sin and bearing our shame. God, so that we might be free. And God... I thank you that Jesus, our Savior, is alive, so that not only has sin been dealt with, but death has been defeated, so that, God, now we don't have to live in fear, but we get to live with hope, hope of a life that starts with you now and lasts forever. God, I pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, the church said, amen. amen. If you have a Bible... Go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 22. That's where we're going to be this morning. Matthew chapter 22. Before we read, you guys ready for a review? Yes, sweet. Two people are. So, in the first week of this series, we looked at the Great Commission, right? And we had determined that there are four things that Jesus mentions in the Great Commission as it pertains to mission, the fourfold mission of the church. The first one was what? Go. Yeah, Grandma Ray's not here. She doesn't have her notebook, so she can't say all these. <laughs> Go. What's the next one? Make disciples. Right? Make disciples. What's the third one? Do you guys remember? Baptize them. And what's the fourth one? Teach them, right? This is the mission that Jesus gives to his disciples in the Great Commission. Okay? So after we work through that and we determine, okay, what Jesus wants his disciples to go out and do is to make disciples. And not just make disciples, but make disciples who do what? Make disciples who make disciples, right? This is a, this is a cyclical thing that Jesus, he wants his disciples to take this. And as they make disciples, the whole point of this is teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, right? And if Jesus' command is to go and make disciples, then what should I be going and doing? I should be making disciples and teaching them how to do what? Make disciples, right? Does everyone, everyone follows. So then what we determined was, okay, if this is the mission of the church, the next question was, what is a disciple? And so, in the second week of the series, we looked at Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, where Jesus looks at this group of fishermen, 
And he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And we talked about the fact that the definition of a disciple is in the invitation to be a disciple, right? And there were three things there that we pointed out. It was a little bit easier than the four from the week before, right? Three things. And if you remember nothing else, remember head, heart, and hands, okay? But a disciple is someone who first does what? Follows Jesus, Okay, a disciple is someone who follows Jesus. The second part of that, a disciple is someone who does what? Is changed by Jesus, right? So, a disciple is someone who's following Jesus, that I make the conscious decision to follow him, and I make him the head, I make him the authority figure, I do what he tells me to do, I follow after him, right? Right? So a disciple is someone who follows Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and where does that start? In the heart. That I am transformed from the inside out. That as I follow Jesus, the expectation for me is that I do not look the same all the time for my entire life that I've decided to follow him. The goal is that as I follow Jesus, I begin to look more and more like him and less and less like me. And the third part of following Jesus, after following him, or the third part of being a disciple, after following him and being changed by him, is what? Being committed to the mission of Jesus. That I would be changed at the head level, the heart level, and then the hands, right? What I do, what I commit myself to, changes. That is what a a disciple is, okay? And then after that, we talked about, okay, if that's the case, then what does it mean to follow, right? And last week, we looked at a text in Luke chapter 9 where we talked about some pretty gruesome stuff as it pertained to following Jesus because Jesus tells his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You guys remember, we talked about the fact that if I'm going to follow Jesus, one of the very first things that I need to do is recognize it's not about me anymore. My way, my will, the way that I would normally do things, I have to set that aside. And the sin that came along with that, I have to put that sin to death. And we talked about the fact that there is no resurrection life without death. So in order for me to live this resurrection life, this abundant life that Jesus has promised, I need to die. Dustin, in his sinful nature, needs to die. I need to deny myself. I need to take up my cross. And I need to take up my cross how often, church? Daily. And Jesus says, then follow me. And so today, after looking at a pretty gruesome and uncomfortable text last week. I want to lighten the load for us today. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, good. Okay. So today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 22, and this should sound familiar because Aaron shared this message with our kids this morning. Okay? This should also sound familiar if you've been in a church building ever. Okay? Matthew chapter 22, verse 34, we read this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, this was a group of people that did not believe in the resurrection from the dead, so they were sad, you see. I appreciate the pity laugh. That made my day. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Now, this happened a few times, at least that we see recorded, where Jesus is tested. He's tested about what specifically here? He's tested about the Word of God, which I don't know if you guys know anything about Jesus, but like he was kind of involved in like the whole writing of it, right? He inspired it. And the whole, like this whole thing is about him. 
but these guys are confident. They, they think they know more than him. So they come to him and they test him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment that we as a people can follow. And I've said this before from the pulpit. When this text is pointed to, oftentimes I hear many Christians, many followers of Jesus say, Dustin, that's an oversimplification. I don't think so. Jesus is asked, what's the greatest thing in the law? What is the greatest command that is given to us to follow? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God. How? With all of your heart. With all of your soul. With all of your mind. Some passages say with all of your strength. How do you love God? With everything you have. Every fiber of your being, from your heart to your soul to your mind to your strength, is devoted to loving God. And then he says, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. How many commandments did they ask for? One. One. Right? They asked for one command. And Jesus is like, I'm going to, this is free for you guys. I'm going to give you a second one. You paid for one, I'm going to give you one free. This is a BOGO moment. The first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So again, as Aaron identified this morning, there are two things that Jesus points out to these Pharisees. What are they, church? Let's try that again. There are two things that... Wake up. Everybody awake? Woo, woo. Woo, woo. Everyone awake? Eh, eh, eh. Alarm time, right? Okay. Jesus answers the question of this Pharisee twofold. What is the greatest command? He says, what? What's the first one? Love God. Love God with your everything. And then what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what Jesus will include here, in addition to that, is he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So, you remember I pointed out that oversimplification earlier, where people are like, That's, you're oversimplifying it. There's so many more commands. There's so many more things for us to follow. Jesus says, look, if you can obey these two, you will not break the law. I mean, look at, look at the Ten Commandments that are given. The first four commandments that are given to the people, all the way back in Exodus, have to do with loving God. You shall have no other gods before me, honor the Sabbath day, keep it holy, right? Those things, they pertain to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then you look at the next six commandments, and what do they have to do with? Your neighbor. Don't murder, which should be like, don't, guys, don't kill people, right? It's, a, it's a, a thing that shouldn't happen, but happens way too often. Don't covet don't lie, right? These things, they pertain to our relationship with people and loving people. And then if you were to look through the other 600-some commandments, they can all be summed up in these two things. And Jesus says, look, if you can love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you can love your neighbor as you love yourself, you will not break the law. Now, We talked about the fact that following Jesus involves obeying his commandments, doing what he's called us to do. Part of making him the head 
is recognizing that he is our authority figure and what he says we do. Yes? Everybody understand that? This is the thing. I'm going to make it real easy. If you want to follow Jesus and you recognize him as the head, you recognize him as the authority figure, the call, put as plainly as I could, as simply as I could, is love. And if you can do that, you will not break commandments. How cool is that? Now the issue... is that that's not easy. Loving the Lord my God with everything that I have is not easy because if I have to love him with everything that I have and I place him above everything else, then what do I have to do in order to do that? What did we talk about last week? I need to do what? I need to deny myself. Because my natural inclination in the flesh is not to love the Lord my God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my mind. What is my natural inclination in the flesh, in my sinful nature, to do what? To love me. That's not easy. Everybody agree with that? To place God above me, but then, not just God. I'm also called to place you above me. To love you as I would love myself. Which, can I just say, like I love, I'm going to start this by saying I love all of you. I love people as a whole. People are great. People are also dumb. And people are infuriating. And people make decisions that baffle me. Some people know exactly what to say to get a rise out of me. Some people that I've never even met know exactly where my buttons are and how to push them. And so how do I do that? And... and, And here's the thing, when I look at what God has done for me, the whole loving him thing, like, I could see how that tracks. The debt that he's forgiven, the life that he gave, the sacrifice that he made, that tracks. Logically, I could see giving myself to him in love fully. You haven't done that for me. That's hard. And I would like to just get up here and say, hey guys, this is super easy. Just love God, love people. Come now while we stand and sing and just have it be this super easy. But is it easy? No, it's hard. And so what is offered to us in the pages of Scripture to help us contextualize this so that we can understand it better? I'll tell you, in John chapter 13, as Jesus is getting ready to leave his disciples, okay, he's, he's just finished the Last Supper with his disciples. He's just washed their feet. Judas has gone off to betray Jesus. Jesus is getting ready to go off to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried, and he's going to be killed. And so Jesus starts off this last little discourse, this last moment of teaching with his disciples by saying this, a new command I give you. A new command. Meaning this is different from previous commands, yes? This is not the same command. And if you look at it at face value, you're like, yeah, but that's the same. Love, right? That's the command. But pay attention. A new command I give you, love one another. Still the same? Yes. As I have loved you. How was I supposed to love my neighbor, according to Matthew 22? 
as I love myself, right? Love my neighbor as myself. Now, now, the call is not to love you as I would love me. The call is to love you how? As Jesus has loved me. This is the command. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, again, this mission that Jesus has is to seek and save the lost, to bring people to him, and to make disciples. And so this whole love thing is not just about relationship with God and relationship with church people. This love thing carries far beyond that because in verse 35, he says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If what? If you love one another. And I've said this before, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I will repeat myself until we get it. I will repeat myself until I get it. The world will not know that I'm a disciple of Jesus because I'm right. The world will not know that I'm a disciple of Jesus because I can debate. The world will not know that I'm a disciple of Jesus because I can call people on their sin. And and not just call people on their sin, but openly condemn them for it. Which, John 3, 16 and 17, says... Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, right? So if Jesus isn't coming to condemn, do I get to? Answer, no. None of those things show the world that I am really a disciple of Jesus. Posting things to get a rise out of people on Facebook does not show people that I'm a disciple of Jesus. Does everyone hear me? Jesus gives one thing. He says, by this, the world will know that you belong to me, that you follow me. And that is what? Come on. Love. Like he has loved you. That is how the world will know that we belong to him. And then, if you look a little bit later, in 1 John, we see this. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, going on through verse 19. Dear friends, let us, what? Love one another. Why? Why? Where does love come from, church? Love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. Right? Does that sound familiar? Where did that come from? First John. Someone didn't just, like, make that up on the spot. That's scriptural. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. And not just that it comes from God, which we're going to find out here in a minute. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So love is a natural result of me being born of God and knowing God. Not just knowing about God, knowing God. Being in relationship with God. And then he says, whoever does not love does not know God. Uh Uh-oh. If I don't love, I don't know who God really is. Why? Because God is what, church? Love. Not just that he teaches love. Not just that he has the capacity to love. Not just that he gives us the example of love. God is, by his very nature, love. He is love. And we'll come back to this. Let's continue. Okay? Verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. 
Not that we loved God. Pause. Church, this whole process that plays out in Scripture, from beginning, the very beginning, when Adam and Eve broke the world by sinning, This whole thing where God is continually reaching out to his people and making covenants with his people and and forgiving and forgiving and extending grace and mercy. and God does not do that because of how much they love him. Do we understand this? This is a theme throughout the pages of Scripture. As a matter of fact, if you look in John chapter 11, this this baffles my mind. In John chapter 11... We find the story of Lazarus. You guys are familiar with this story? Have you guys heard this story? Lazarus is sick, so Mary and Martha send a messenger to Jesus. And what does the messenger say to Jesus? Lord, the one who loves you is sick, right? No. No. Mary and Martha do not appeal to Lazarus' love for Jesus. I find that fascinating. Why would they choose to not appeal to him based on Lazarus' love for him? Or really anybody's love for him? Because my love is incomplete and broken. What do they appeal to? Lord, the one whom you love is sick. God does not move towards me because of my love for him. Jesus did not come to this earth to die for me because of my love for him. As a matter of fact, look in Romans chapter 5. Jesus came and died while I was his enemy, while I stood in opposition to him. It's not about my love. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to do what? Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to... Oh, next slide, Corey. There it is. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There it is. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment in this world We are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And then he says in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. So let's backtrack. Let's go all the way back to Matthew 22. And even before that, where we look at the call to follow is a call to obey. A call to do what he has asked of us. A call to submit to him and to his headship and to do what he says. Yes? Not if you understand. Yes. So then, if the call is to do what he has said... The greatest thing that he has ever said, the greatest thing that he has ever called us to do is to love him and to love people. Yes, everyone, nod your heads. We follow. Yes? Now, I am not called to love you based on my capacity to love. Here's the beauty of the gospel. Here is the beauty of what we have been called to, church. Please pay attention. 
in the call to love is also an invitation for us to pay attention to love. I'll say that again. In the call to love is also a call for us to pay attention to love. In that, how I'm taught to love, how I'm told to love, is not to love from me. I am taught to love by looking at the one who did so perfectly. I am taught to love by the one who by his very nature is love. And how that has been demonstrated is that he made the motion to love me first. But Dustin, people are terrible. You're right. So are you. But Dustin, people are so frustrating. So are you. But God, the thing that, Dustin, the things that these people have done, are they even worthy of love? Are you? In your sin and your brokenness, should God have moved at all? In your rebellion and you standing as an enemy of him, should he have moved at all? I wouldn't have. Good news for you guys, I'm not God. When you stood in opposition to him, he moved first. And he loved you. And so, the call to love is a response of looking at the one who did it first. The beautiful thing about every command that I see in the pages of Scripture, especially the ones Jesus commands for us to do, he demonstrated them. The call to love is no different. Jesus very perfectly shows us what it looks like to love the people around us. And we see this as Jesus denies himself and takes up his cross and walks to Golgotha. He's not just dying for the good people, if those even exist. He was lifted up and crucified, not just for those that chose to follow him, but also for those that spat on him. For those who hurled insults at him, for those who whipped him and beat him even for the one that kissed his cheek in the garden and betrayed him, and for the one who denied him three times before the rooster crowed. He gave his life for even the worst of people. Including a man named Barabbas. Are you guys familiar with Barabbas? Barabbas was a criminal And at the trial of Jesus during this whole time that this is going on, it's a tradition to release a prisoner to the people during the time of Passover. And so Pilate gets up and he goes, all right, which one do you want? Do you want this Barabbas guy or do you want Jesus? Now, Jesus has done nothing wrong. Jesus has healed. Jesus has spoken about nothing but love and care and kindness. Jesus resurrected people. Jesus calms storms. This man has done nothing wrong. This man was an insurrectionist and a rebel and a murderer. And who do they want? Barabbas. The beautiful thing about the story of Barabbas, everybody pay attention. I'm Barabbas. You are Barabbas. Jesus demonstrates beautifully that he goes to a cross for even the worst of us, those that would spit in his face. And so, Dustin, how can I love the people around me? By looking at Jesus. And by recognizing that the love that he's calling me to give to you is no different than the love that he had given to me. The way that he is calling us to go and treat people is the way that he treated me. 
and the way that he is calling me to deny myself and take up my cross daily and follow him and potentially walk to this place of suffering is exactly what he did for me. So why, why follow? Not just what does it look like to follow, why even do this in the first place? We do this not as an attempt to earn favor from God because he already loves us. We do this as a response, church, to what he has done. We love because he first loved us. Because he made the first move we are now called to make the first move because he was a person of peace. I am now called to be a person of peace because he made the move to live sacrificially. I am now called to live sacrificially. Not because I'm trying to earn anything from him, but because I know that everything I have is because of him. The grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, and the love that have been poured out are because of him. So we make the motion towards people the way he made the motion towards us. Does everybody understand? This is the beauty of the gospel, and this is the beauty of what we've been called to as people. And and as I say all of this, I just, I just want to clear the air. Does that mean that this ceases to be difficult? No. But I think it makes it easier for us, makes it easier for me. Because now I'm not trying to love people out of my understanding of love. I'm trying to love people as he has loved me. And so I'll leave us with this thought. We follow Jesus by living into the command to love God and to love others as he has loved us. So last week, we talked about following Jesus in terms of living sacrificially. Today, we talk about loving and following Jesus as it pertains to the greatest command. Next week, we're going to look at a text in John 15 and start to make a transition from following Jesus, what it looks like to follow Jesus, to what does it look like to be changed by Jesus. But for now, again, I want to leave us with this thought. We follow Jesus by living into the command to love God and to love others as he has loved us. Church, we're about to spend some time in communion. I want to pray over us as we prepare to sing a song together and as we prepare to dive into those thoughts. So let's bow and let's pray together. Father, you are so good. And God, as I look at Jesus, I am reminded of the fact that I am so unworthy of what he has done. I don't, I don't deserve the love that you've extended. But God, thank you so much that it did not depend on that. That you coming and rescuing me did not depend on my worthiness. God, that the reason you came is not because of me at all, it's because of who you are. And how much you love us in spite of our brokenness, in spite of our weakness, in spite of our sin. God, you love us so much. And God, in light of that, you have called us to do the same. And so, God, may we take the example of your son, Jesus, and God, may we love you the way that he has demonstrated love. God, that we would live sacrificially. 
God, that we would give you our heart, that we would give you our mind, that we would give you our soul, that we would give you our strength, that we would love you with everything that we have, mindful of what you've done and in response to what you've done. And then, God, day by day, teach us how to carry that love to other people, to show them and to demonstrate to them what you have given to us. God, it's my prayer that the world would know us by that and that alone. God, that your people would begin to be recognized more and more for the love that they have. The way that we treat people. God, not as people of hatred or people of anger or people who riot or people who argue. God, may we live and love as you have loved us. God, as we take time now to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made that demonstrated that ultimate love. God, I pray that we would take a moment now to examine ourselves and our hearts. God, not to, not to beat ourselves up, but to find joy in this moment. To celebrate what you've done. God, that we've been set free. Set free from our sin. Set free from our guilt and shame. Set free from death. Because of what your son Jesus has done. And God, again, may we, after this moment, begin to live into that. In response to everything that you've done for us. God, may we love you and may we love people. God, again, I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful, God, so much that it's in Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we have hope because he is alive. He's alive. God, again, I thank you. I, I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. The church said... Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> all to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will seat for communion. Oh, okay.
I wasn't supposed to do this. Uh, Matt Christie's sick, so let's, let's run it. I was telling Kat, this last week we were in Jamaica, and beautiful time there, as you can see from the sun-kissed uh, skin that I have. Uh, we had an all-inclusive resort. It was fantastic. We spent most of our time out by a pool, sitting there, just getting away from life, getting away from reality. Except there was this really annoying factor regarding our, our uh, resort, and that was that we were close to the airport. And so you'd be laying there, and then you'd hear this loud sound of the plane that would go by. And you get you could see people get annoyed by it, uh, because when you're in paradise, the last thing you want to do is think about going home. But what five, six times a day, you would have this plane that would fly over. And I told Kat, I said this is a perfect illustration for what we deal with, because so often, so many times in this world, people just want to numb themselves and they want to get away from reality. But church, this world is not our home. We are just passing through and we need the reminder like an airplane flying over top of us that this world is not our home. That we are just passing through. Too often we get caught up in so many things. We run to work. We run run to our hobbies. We run to our kids' sports. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. The Hebrews writer says this. He says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of of lips that acknowledge his name. Every week, the church has gathered for centuries upon centuries to offer him praise, to offer this reminder, to take part in communion, to be reminded that this world is not our home. We are just passing through. And so if you would, join me, and let's remind ourselves of what Jesus has done and the reality to come, that this world is a fading place. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy to us. As Dustin communicated, it is fantastic. It captures our heart and captures our mind. And Lord, it is our prayer that it would capture our behavior. Father, that we would live in line with your desires. Uh, Father, as we partake of this bread, may it not be lost on us that this moment is meant to echo in to our future reality, and Father, that we would live for you continually when we are at work, when we are with friends, when we're at home. It's in your Son's precious and holy name we pray, and the church said, amen. The Hebrews writer brings it up that we are sanctified by his blood, that it was his blood that was spilled so that we could have freedom. Part of communion is the fruit of the vine, that little piece of juice that you have in that container that represents his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins that he took on himself. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blood that was spilled that sanctifies us. And Father, may we continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to you as our God, our King, and our Savior. It's in your Son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Conveniently in the Scriptures, right after that portion of text, Uh, The Hebrews writer, this is found in Hebrews chapter 13, by the way, if you want to do like the fact check. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16 now. The writer of Hebrews says this, Do not neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. How convenient is that? 
that after focusing in on the sacrifice of Jesus, the reminder that this world is not our home, then it's almost like a perfect communion passage, but I haven't heard it often brought up, that he comes back around and he's like, well, and also, by the way, remember to share what you got. It's one of the reasons why I kind of like that this is tied together, because we give because God gave first. And so, in this moment, many of us have already assigned in our head what we're going to pass along to the community of faith. But as you go into the weeks ahead, here's my encouragement to you, my uh, exhortation to you. Consider the lengths at which you give, the lengths at which you share. Because I'm reminded as a daddy that sometimes my kids really like to share, but then there are other times not so much. And maybe you're comfortable sharing up to this point. My question to us is, does that really impress God if we're just comfortable sharing up to this point? Because maybe there's, there's like one more step we can take and God's like, ah, that, that's faith. That's beyond your, your security level, your comfort level, that. Just like Jesus said to believers in the past, that's impressive faith. I haven't seen faith like that in all of Israel. Let's go down in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life that was given on our behalf. You have continually given to us, and we are thankful for it. Lord, we ask, we request uh, that you would give us faith, faith that would give generously, uh, that would set aside and share, that we would be rich in good works. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, for our final song here, um, we do have the opportunity to uh, text the great and powerful Charlie Ray. I don't know why I thought of the Wizard of Oz, but I just thought that was funny. Uh, so if you want to text Charlie, he has a closing prayer for today. Uh, his number should be scrolling across the screen here in a second, but I will pull it up as well. So it is 330-316-2411. If you want to text him your prayer request, you can do that at this time. You can also come up front during this song if you would like the congregation to pray over you. With that being said, let's stand and let's sing our final song. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, make the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth. From the ends of the earth. And from the depths of the sea. From the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise his name from the ends of the earth. From the ends of the earth and from the depths of the sea. From the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Unto the Lord. Amen. Have a seat, guys.
Good morning, church. Morning, church. Okay. Got quite the list of prayers. I'm going to start out with a praise from uh, Keith. Uh, he's healing well after his recent surgery, but he wanted to thank all of you uh, for praying for him and calling on him and stuff like that. He was, he was recovering. Things were going great for him, so we just want to continue to pray over him. Uh, Joey asked this morning that we would pray for, he's going this Tuesday to get the stitches out from his surgery. He's doing well. Uh, just continues prayers there. Uh, also have a text from uh, Katie, actually from Emsley. Emsley wants us to pray that we will all love each other. So we'll make sure we pray for that today. Um, Angie mentioned this morning that her son Bobby uh, has been diagnosed with high blood pressure. Now, Bobby's a really young guy, and to get blood pressure at this stage in the game is unusual, so we want to make sure we're praying over him. Uh, we want to make sure we're keeping Rich uh, Wonderlick in our prayers. If you guys might have got the text this week, uh, Rich had surgery. Uh, they thought there were going to be complications, but things went very, very well. Uh, he's actually at home recovering, so that's awesome. Uh, we want to make sure we're praying for Matt Christie. He's homesick today. Uh, my mom and actually Darletta, both of them are stayed home today because they're dealing with vertigo. And I don't know if you've had vertigo or you know anything about vertigo. I experience it. It's terrible. You can't stand up. You're off balance and all that things. I actually kidded with my mom that I thought she's been in balance for a long time, but that's beside the point. Um... <laughs> uh, we want to make sure we're praying over Sean uh, Perez. He's feeling actually better, still not 100%, but he's going to go through some testing to try to find out exactly what's going on with him. So we'll be praying for Sean. Uh, Tim Simmons, as you know, he's going through uh, treatments for chemo. Uh, Tim's had a rough week, just really feeling tired and worn out, so we want to make sure we're praying over him. And then uh, finally here, Mike Christie, uh, Matt's brother, uh, Patty's eldest son, uh, he hit a deer doing 70 miles an hour. The deer came through the front windshield, and they had to remove, like, a bunch of glass. He actually had glass in his eyes and all that, so he's, he's beat up pretty, pretty badly. So we want to make sure we're praying for him. Hey, Charles. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Good deal. That's great. Anything else? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, as we come before you now, we thank you for this day that you've given us to uh, just come together as a family and worship your name and uh, just kneel before your throne. Father, we are grateful for uh, the message that uh, Dustin delivered this morning. Uh, echoing Emsley's uh, prayer request that, Father, help us to be a people of love, uh, people of sacrifice, and people of consideration for others. Father, we're grateful that uh, Keith's surgery went so well. Uh, we're grateful for his recovery and all that's going through that. Uh, we pray, Father, that your hand would be continued on him as he continues to recover from that and uh, get back to uh, the things that he needs to be doing. Father, we pray over Joey this week as he gets the surgeries out or the stitches out from his surgery. We pray, Father, that that goes well. Uh, we pray over uh, Bobby Macon. Uh, Father, we pray that the high blood pressure might be controlled. The doctors are able to find out what's going on there and that uh, it's something that's easily managed for him. Father, we're grateful that Rich's surgery went so well this week. Uh, the doctors were able to handle the issues that had arisen there. Uh, the fact that he is home already and recovering, Father, is a great blessing. We just pray that your, your hand would be upon him as he continues to mend. Father, we pray for some of those that are home uh, just not feeling well or thought, thinking of Matt and uh, my mom and Darletta uh, dealing with various ailments. We just ask, Father, that these things pass quickly and they're able to get back up on their feet uh, as, as soon as possible. Father, we pray over Sean at this time, and we know that he's had a a rough go, um, just uh, you know, with the passing of Jenny, and that the family has uh, been ailing from that. 
but also, Father, the, his health has not been great. We just pray, Father, that he, as, he, as he goes through the testing process, they'll be able to find out what's going on there and give him a path that he's able to get back to recovery. Father, we ask that you be with Tim, uh, as this has been a hard week for him, uh, just feeling tired and without energy. We just ask, Father, that uh, he's able to uh, feel your strength and your power, and he's able to deal with the treatments that he has been going through. Father, we are uh, grateful that uh, Michael has had such a, a speedy recovery from his accident. Father, such a scary thing, a close call uh, with what he has gone through, and we just pray for his continued improvement. Father, as we leave this place this day, we just ask, Father, that uh, we might be a people of love, that we might be in consideration of uh, the tasks that we're called to. Uh, Father, we pray that we would put you first in our lives, and Father, that uh, we would act like your son to those around us and extend love to them. Father, we are grateful for your son, the grace, mercy, and salvation that we find in him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, church.